Mr. Goldman for five minutes questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank our witnesses uh, for being here today, Ms. Nobles and Ms. Dunn. Uh, I just want to express uh, my sincere condolences. I was a federal prosecutor for 10 years who charged people for gang-related and drug trafficking crimes. Um, unfortunately, this is not the first time I've had to interact with families of victims, and my heart goes out to you, and I, I just want I want to apologize in some ways to you that you are here um, really to share your story, but you're being used in, as a fact witness for an impeachment um, investigation. And obviously, given you know, what your experience has been, you don't have the background um, to understand what a high crime misdemeanor is and how it relates to this. And so I, I hope that um, you're, you're handling that okay. Um, you know, one of the things that the chairman said at the beginning of his opening statement was uh, that he wishes that Democrats would turn our sympathy um, into action. Uh, and quite ironically said, thoughts and prayers are not enough. At first I thought we were at a gun violence um, hearing where uh, we were talking about the repeated thoughts and prayers of the two mass shootings that happen every day. But uh, I do want to just go through some of the uh, actions, as, as the chairman pointed out, turn sympathy into action. Um, because I assume, Ms. Dunn, you, you would agree, would you not, that it would help to stop the fentanyl trade and fentanyl trafficking from coming into this country if we had more law enforcement officers at the border and more resources and technology to stop the fentanyl from coming in. Do, do you agree with that? I disagree with that because Border Patrol is now being used to make sandwiches and to screen people and let them into our country. Okay, well, so... So I disagree in, with you. So you're you're saying that the you're, so you're saying that uh, you're upset because the border patrol is not doing uh, is making sandwiches. I think you said so. You don't think it would be helpful to have more border patrol officers who are charged with stopping the fentanyl trade. I would like the border patrol to be able to do the job that they were hired to do. Well, one way every border way, patrol sorry. officer that I have spoken to has told me that their hands are tied by this administration and Mr. Mayorkas. I've been well, to the border, sir, have you? The, H have you? I, I'm, excuse me, I'm asking the I, question. I'm just wondering. And the, 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 the problem with that is that um, in Congress, this, this Congress, we have um, interviewed nine senior officials uh, of the, of, under DHS in, in a variety of different capacities. Um, Every single one of them has said that it would be helpful to provide more resources at the border to stop the flow of fentanyl coming in. And that is actually exactly what President Biden has done. Uh, in last year's budget, fiscal year 2023, the appropriations um, it included 300 additional U.S. Border Patrol agents, which was the first increase since 2011 included 125 more CBP officers, $70 million for non-intrusive inspection, and 200 House Republicans, including every single Republican serving at the time who currently sits on this committee, voted against that bill. Under the Biden administration, the Department of Homeland Security has seized more fentanyl and arrested more criminals for fentanyl-related crimes in the last two years than in the previous five years combined. And even in this Congress, when we had the Department of Homeland Security appropriations markup, Mr. Correa offered an amendment that would provide more money and more uh, resources for the border to stop the fentanyl trade and every single Republican voted it down. But that's not it, even with the supplemental request from the White House. They requested $1.2 billion to crack down on the trafficking of dangerous and lethal illicit drugs like fentanyl, including over $300 million 
for the most effective non-intrusive inspection systems. And of course, 90% of fentanyl comes through the ports of entry, so having those inspection systems would do it. Again, the Republicans will not support the border with additional resources to do the job that the Secretary wants to do. And so we are here yet again for a political stunt to make an argument that this administration is not doing anything even as it is negotiating to try to address the problems at the border and even as it is trying to increase the number of border agents and technology to address the fentanyl system. Let's stop this sham impeachment hearing and let's go negotiate with the Senate and the White House who are doing that right now with Secretary Mayorkas to address the problems at the border. I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop, for his five minutes questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Dunn, I was watching you as we uh, listened to my friend from New York just now and, and uh, heard what you said. Uh, you did a fantastic job sort of uh, defeating his point in the little bit of time he gave you. Uh, but as he was saying that what that they make the issue that Republicans aren't sending more money to the border, uh, what every jurisdiction in the United States, notably New York, Chicago, and others are suffering is a deluge of immigrants that the country cannot assimilate, that are not prepared to be assimilated culturally by, by linguistic background, by experience. They're not, we can't get, it, get the job done that way. The only proposals that Democrats have offered, let this go down on record, the only proposals that have been offered is to send more money to the border, which will be used to process more immigrants faster into the country, number one, or number two, to legalize them all, grant them amnesty, as if that would somehow address any of the problems that we're experiencing. Not one of them would be addressed. So I appreciate Ms. Nobles, you and Ms. Dunn, you for being here. It must be particularly infuriating to hear that when you've suffered the ultimate uh, victimhood from the violations of law that the Secretary of Homeland Security has administered. So, Ms. Professor Perlstein, I want to go to you, though, because I want to talk about, talk about that victim, the rule of law. Um, you said in your paper in defense of Secretary Mayorkas that to the extent the majority of reports allegations against the secretary are related to those policies, in particular the suggestion that Secretary Mayorkas somehow exceeded the scope of his lawful authority to set priorities for the enforcement of U.S. immigration law. That claim has been rejected most recently by an overwhelming bipartisan majority of the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, are you referring to the United States Te versus Texas case from last June? I am. But there, the, the majority opinion says, quote, we take no position on whether the executive branch here is complying with its legal obligations. We hold only that the federal courts are not the proper forum to resolve this dispute. So when you read that language, how do you come to the conclusion that the court decided that Secretary Mayorkas is acting in accordance with his legal responsibilities? The basis of the court's ruling on standing that you just described was as Justice Kavanaugh's opinion for the majority said, the authority to decide how to prioritize and how aggressively to pursue legal actions against defendants belongs to the executive branch under Article II. That was the basis of the ruling that was there is no standing in this case. Well, they also said words, they've taken no position whether the Justice executive that, branch is complying Justice with its legal obligations. How is Trump that? Trump appointed said, this is authority that belongs exclusively to the executive branch. Right. What you're referring to is the court says we're not in the business of refereeing anything where the executive has any amount of prosecutorial discretion. But they also say we're not deciding here whether the executive branch is complying with its legal obligations. Both of those propositions are true. They're both in the opinion. Are they not, ma'am? The court found that there was no standing because... No, ma'am. I asked you a question. Qu the this proposition is in the opinion as well, correct? I read it. It's accurate. The court found there was no standing. That is also true. I didn't ask you about standing. I asked you whether this language that I just read, where the court said we're not determining whether the executive branch is complying with its legal obligations, that's also in the court's opinion, correct? That may be in the court's opinion. But that's what, what I said... asked. Thank you. Let me ask you this. At the oral argument... This was Justice Kavanaugh's question to the Solicitor General, Solicitor General of the United States. I think your position is, instead of judicial review, Congress has to resort to shutting down the government. 
or impeachment or dramatic steps. If, it, if some administration comes in and says, we're not going to enforce laws, or at least not going to enforce the laws to the degree that Congress, by law, has said the laws should be enforced. And that's forcing, I mean, I understand your position, but it's forcing Congress to take dramatic steps. Isn't that what he said at oral argument? I don't have the transcript of oral argument. All right, do you disagree with his proposition as I just recited it to you? Justice Alito said in his lone dissent that impeachment along with funding cutoffs and others were among the potentially available remedies that Congress has. The majority opinion, none of the other eight justices, including all of the justices appointed by the former president, mentioned impeachment in that context. So you're aware, are you familiar with the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act of 1996? It's a large act. Which part? The part that the, that the United States Supreme Court considered in United States versus Texas? I've read the case. Okay. You know that, as Justice Alito describes in the dissent, that in that situation, the Congress decided to re withdraw some of the discretion the, the executive has by requiring detention and uh, it, specifically in certain cases, right? What the court said was that for the last 27 years since these laws, that law, was enacted in their current form, all five presidential administrations have determined the resource constraints necessitated prioritization in making immigration arrests. If you evaded a question like that before the bench, they would not like it. I yield back, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. The, the <laughs>